All right. Um, I am so excited to be here. Thank you to everyone who's tuning in today to this special portion of the Bloomberg Financial Innovation Summit. My name is Milton Demures, and you're going to be spending the next hour with me um, at CoinShares. We are really excited about everything that's happening at the intersection of culture, the creator economy, and finance. And so we've put together two very special sessions for you. Um, I am here here right now with two amazing individuals who I'm so happy to call my friends. Um, I'm also a collector of their art, and they're also two of the brightest minds and most incredible builders in this new world of NFTs. Um, for those who are watching, uh, I hope you've heard of NFTs, but for those who haven't, an NFT or a non-fungible token is basically a type of smart contract um, that allows people to create one of one digital assets. Um, and so right now in the creator community, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm around NFTs. To date, there's been over $8 billion of economic value created around NFTs, art NFTs in particular, just on the Ethereum network. But NFTs are being launched on all sorts of blockchain networks, including Solana, which you heard about probably over the last two days, um, Avalanche, and a, a whole variety of blockchains. So we're going to delve into this idea of the new creator economy. We're going to start with the art side, and then the second half of this hour will be the music side. So hopefully you like art and music. I think those are two things that most people tend to like and bring us a lot of joy as, as humanity. So um, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Marguerite de Crucelle, aka Coin Artist, and Micah Johnson. Um, Micah and Marguerite, I'm actually going to let you introduce yourselves because you'll do a much better job than me. But why don't we start with you, Marguerite? Just give us a brief overview. Who is Coin Artist and what are you doing in the NFT space with your company, Blocking Games? Uh, thank you, Meltem. And hey, everybody. Um, so Coin Artist is my um, my artist brand. I've been a creative in this sp the blockchain space since 2014. I started making gamified paintings essentially by hiding private keys in both physical and digital mediums using steganography techniques. Um, so then essentially creating online digital treasure hunts where people would race to claim this Bitcoin private key, which was you know accessible to to all. Um, and so it had this effect of pulling the sword from the stone in the end of these uh, treasure hunts. So <clears throat> that, though, became more elaborate over the years as what happened was um, the work attracted other engineers, online talent. And so we, our little team became a super group of talent, which then led to establishing Blockade Games in January 2018. And Blockade was a initiative to create free-to-play blockchain gaming through NFTs, NFTs being a vehicle in which a player could have this game asset, which could mirror their achievements in game and be transferable and go with them along their journey as a gamer. Um, so uh, currently building Neon District, which is a cyberpunk RPG. And um, it is basically that mission is how do we put NFTs into gamers' hands in which they can participate in this new global economy around cryptocurrency. And for those who haven't played Neon District, um, highly recommend you check it out. Marguerite, where can people go to play Neon District or interact with some of the items in the game? Neondistrict.io is uh, the site. Amazing. Um, Micah, why don't we shift over to you? And I, I have to disclose, I um, am a collector of, of Micah's pieces, and um, he's done some amazing things with, with Aku. So tell us a little bit about what you've been building, Micah, and some of the really unique things you've been doing in connecting NFTs to a much larger audience than just us crypto nerds. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on here. Um, yeah, my background is a little different. I uh, played seven years professional baseball, um, and that's all I ever did. Never did a job resume, never, you know, uh, had a job interview. And so when I got out into the world, I loved art and discovered art in 2016 with, when I was playing with the Dodgers. Um, I got out into the world and, and you know, kept painting and realized nobody was buying my paintings when the jersey was off, off, off me. And uh, realized I needed to make money. And that's when I found out about digital art um, and, and NFTs and, and crypto. And uh, that was in late 2019 um, and put out some um, some works as a, a super rare. 
And uh, around that time, my nephew asked if astronauts could be black. And I started painting him as an astronaut um, with an astronaut helmet and just sending it to him. Uh, I began to animate those um, and put them on Super Rare. And there was an amazing response to those. And it was really fulfilling. It was like the most fulfilling moment of my life, like seeing the way people like resonated with these paintings. Um, called a gallery that summer and said, hey, I got some works that I think are, like I really like and maybe you could show them. And they agreed to show them and they did really well. And um, I started to think about how I can reach a broader audience with this message uh, and the real target demographic, which is kids um, and empowering them to believe there's no limits to their dreams. And that's how I came up with Aku. Um, and, you know, my belief was that, uh, well, not really a belief. I just didn't know anybody in, in Hollywood or books. Or I just said the only way I can release the character was as an NFT. And so I came up with a way to release 10 chapters, seeding the origin story of Aku uh, through like a minute, a minute and a half, you know, animated clips. Um, released chapter one back in February um, and did, um, to, as an artist, I just wanted to get it out there, did a million dollars in less than a minute um, and became the first NFT to be option for a major feature film. And um, ever since then, I've been thinking about how I can build something even bigger that can also empower creators uh, to, to do the same thing, get their story told. Yeah, and I think what's um, so interesting is, Marguerite, you're creating these gaming experiences, these really interactive experiences with, with NFTs. And Micah, what you're doing is you're storytelling, right? You're creating these beautiful stories and these platforms that allow different stories to be told through the medium of NFTs. So both of you are bringing together art, um, gamified experiences, new types of media, and then injecting in this really cool financial component because in both of the, the metaverses, if you will, that you've created or these, these new realities that you've created, the assets themselves are not only components of the game or the experience, but they're also financial assets, um, which I think is really interesting. And this has, after all, the Bloomberg Financial Innovation Summit. So we're going to focus a little bit on where this intersection of create creativity, culture, and, and crypto um, is happening. So let's just maybe start briefly by talking about, I think, Micah, something you alluded to, which is the challenges around monetizing creativity and culture today and maybe some of what each of you experienced um, as you were building both your businesses in terms of how monetization models today are really, really broken. So Mike, become maybe you could just start by elaborating on, you know, as you were thinking about different ways that you could build the story of Aku in different ways that you could, you know, establish your own financial freedom to help you unleash your creativity. Like, what was that relationship like? And what was it like to sort of fund this and, and figure out how to access capital and, and build, you know, financial capital around the Aku story. And maybe tell us a little bit about that journey and what you learned through through that process for those of us who aren't as familiar with what's going on in the creative space right now. For sure. I think, you know, what's we look back on like, you know, George Lucas's and 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 the Marvels and they had the ability to build this, you know, franchise and 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 um, build this audience base. And I don't think that's possible in Web2 anymore. I think the only way to re really retain ownership over your IP or your creativity are, are utilizing the tools in Web3 to create alignment with your audience. And, you know, it's no secret without that those that audience base behind Aku, there's no TV, there's no film, there's nothing. And so <clears throat> when I released Aku and I saw how well it did and I see how well it's doing and all that, it just I really look at it as an opportunity for an audience and community to invest in the, the, the creation and the IP they really believe in. Um, and so that's what motivates me like every day is to think about how I can drive value back to them as this thing continues to grow and build. And like um, I've, you know, can capitalize the company to bring on more people that can execute on delivering value back to them while also building out the IP. And I think that that model never existed prior. Uh, there was always that dependency in traditional media on distribution to build the audience. Well, now, like you look and there's, you know, Board Apes has over 200,000 followers, you know, on Twitter, like, like the audience building is 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 very possible now um, to have more leverage as you go to get your creativity out into the world and reach a broader audience. Yeah, and I think one of the things we often talk about at our firm is the three Ds, so digitization, driverless banking, and 
changes in distribution models, right? And there, what I think you're alluding to is the ability for you as a creator to distribute what you're creating directly to your fans, right? I also think right. one of the things we speak about regularly is sort of changing the engagement with fans. Can you talk a little bit about, okay, so I buy an Aku piece and I did buy one of your your first Aku draft, actually, chapter one. <laughs> yeah. in Bill, you did. It's actually the first time I bought an NFT with a credit card. So that was the first <laughs> for me. But you were worth it, Micah. Aku was, was totally oh, worth that. Right. <laughs> uh, that credit card swipe. But talk to me a little bit about how you're engaging with your fans. So they buy one of your pieces. Like, what's for the sure. experience like for after? Sure. And then what's the, the financial component of how they get to engage in the upside of Aku as the story grows and becomes, you know, more prevalent across these different mediums? Yeah, I think what's really special about this is being able to have right now is Discord, right? And gating the channels based on like, you know, chapter holders and be able to really go in there and get information and share information in real time, get feedback on their story, on, you know, the direction of what we're doing. It's building in the open, it's building an audience first and then the product second, right? Um, that's like the new model. I think in this new um, creator economy, the chief creative officer is actually the top of the organization, the one that's, you know, creating and the one that is engaging with the audience and getting real time feedback. Um, and so like, you know, one thing that's special about releasing, let's call them early comic books as, as NFTs is the nature of them being on Ethereum and, and ETH wallets and, and it, that you can constantly um, drive value back to them, constantly touch them. Like it's very difficult to understand or you know, for Disney to know that my daughter, my daughter loves Frozen. I go and buy her a Frozen, you know, T-shirt at the store. Like who I am, or, or how to touch me again. Well, with these addresses now, like in these collectors, and you're a collector. Let's say the movie's ready, and the movie's ready to come out, and you want to, we can airdrop you a, a ticket to go see the movie. We can airdrop you um, things for like anything. And so that's what's really special about seeding IP crypto natively is the ability to continually touch the audience and, and bring them along. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that. Marguerite, I think that's something you did really well with one of the first projects you built, um, Plasma Bears. And you have such a great story about your, your niece who played the Plasma Bears game. Do you mind just quickly sharing that story? Because I think it's such a, a beautiful one and really illustrates, I think, you know, the financial upside of, of some of these games. So maybe you could just tell us briefly about, about that story, because I love this. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, so one of the first things we noticed as a game company in 2018 was that the new user drop-off rate for blockchain games was about 99%, which is incredibly high. But once committed, those users had a 10% um, higher higher user spend rate. So like the, the problem then is how do we lower the barrier to entry? So Plasma Bears was a free-to-play game that we designed a proof of concept separate from Neon District. So it was its own IP, own brand as a way to do something highly experimental because we didn't know if it was going to work or not. Um, so basically the commitment we were asking for participants was basically to give their time, play this build a bear type crafting game of these somewhat emo angsty bears um, that had personalities. You would take them on text adventures and you would collect new bear parts. So my niece was one of our, our play testers. Um, she went and played this game all on her own. She actually enjoyed it so much. She went and completed these different bear sets and was built on um, layer two technology at the time. So that's how it was able to be free to play. Um, so the game company is providing all those transaction fees on the back end because they're very cheap. Anyways, we built a, a transfer gateway at the time to allow players to transfer their bears that they wanted from this layer two to Ethereum mainnet. Only 1,200 bears at that time were transferred, and my niece and her mother were actually one of those users that made that transfer. So come 2021, it turns out that one of our collaborate, uh, we collaborated actually at the time with a lot of different artists in the space, and one of those being Xcopy. So Xcopy is now um, a very famous artist, and his work sells for quite a bit. So people under found these bears, found out that Xcopy had been an artist, and now we had plasma bears, so Xcopy plasma bears selling upwards of 100 ETH per bear. So my niece, who and and, my, and her um, mother figure out these bears are selling so well, um, she ends up getting all these offers on her bears. I'm getting messages from my sister saying, is this real? Is this a joke? This can't be real. Like all these offers coming through on her email from OpenSea. So anyways, my niece records a video of her day of selling $60,000 worth of plasma bears that she had made through this free-to-play NFT blockchain game. I love that.
Like, I just love this story because here we have so many different things coming together, right? We have the gaming component. We have you using the platform to help, you know, give different artists opportunities to showcase their work, reach a new audience. Um, and then I think one of the fun things around NFTs has been the joy of discovery, the joy of curation, and these collections sometimes, or these, these pieces of art will take on a life of their own once a few people start collecting them and the status of these artists is elevated. Um, you know, these works can can sell for quite a bit. And the other great piece is, um, you know, the royalties on it. Typically, when a secondary sale happens in the art market, the artist themselves doesn't have any additional upside other than being able to sell new works potentially at a much higher price because their credibility and their brand has grown. But in crypto, right, and with crypto art, we can embed a transaction fee. This is sort of the driverless banking component. We can embed an ongoing secondary market fee in, meaning no matter what happens, every time that piece changes hands and say it changes hands, for a lot of money, the creator, the original artist who, who worked on that piece, or potentially a group of people, right? Say the platform, the game, the artist, and, and a variety of different people who collaborated on that, or in the instance of Aku, right? The creative, the writers, you as the artist, Micah, you could actually have groups of people who can actually participate in, in that value creation, which I think is so exciting and so fun. That was a Four people in the audience, though, so they're looking at this crazy NFT world. It's very confusing. There's a lot going on. Um, as you look at where NFTs are trending, we just had an incredible week of events in New York around NFT NYC. Maybe give us a peek at the future as investors, as people who are think about, thinking about portfolio allocation and where to store our, our wealth in an increasingly chaotic and volatile global macro environment. What are places in the NFT space that you think investors should be looking? Um, what are the opportunities you're excited about? Is it creator coins? Is it buying collections themselves? Is it you know participating in these platforms and participating in the growth of these communities? Give me just a sense of the different ways you think investors can can engage and Marguerite maybe we'll start with you yeah um, you know what's so interesting is this experience of being in New York um, it's really come uh, to light how much people enjoy the in-person experiences and ideas like minting in real life exclusive events that are so decked out as far as like um, dapper put on an interactive architecture exhibit um, as one of their events and anyways I guess like the space, um, both online or virtual realms, and our identities, and the physical realms, I'm not quite sure. It seems like the space is trying to push uh, development in both directions at the same time, and the convergence of these two experiences, because I'm not sure if humans actually, like, when they're in person, they like being in person. They don't like to do augmented reality necessarily. And when they're online, they like being online. So how do these two realms come together simultaneously, or do they, or do they not? I think that's something, like, even me as an investor, I'm thinking about, because I, the questions I have are, like, are we actually trying to converge the two? Or are we actually just focusing on this concept of identity? And if it's this idea of identity coexisting across two different realms, how, how does that have a center point and become the, the node and foc focal point of these developments? Yeah, and I, th I think that's been really interesting to think about, particularly because I always joke like, in the in the metaverse or in cyberspace, my multiple personalities can finally like all exist and <laughs> be their own independent financial entities. And people will have you know pseudonyms or multiple wallets um, where they're interacting with NFTs and games in different ways. So I think it is really interesting. Also, just seeing what's happened with PFPs or profile picture NFTs and the way those have blown up and the way people are using those to express like their identity in terms of belonging to a tribe, whether that's Board Eight Yacht Club um, or CryptoPunks or, you know, Ether Rocks. I myself identify as a rock. So there's all of these different um, profile pictures that people are, are buying and really identifying with, and, and they're using that as a starting point for gathering in, in physical space. Um, Micah, as you think about sort of the investing side and as you talk to people who want to invest in NFTs, where do you sort of direct them to look or where do you think the opportunities are for people who are looking at how they integrate this investment thesis into their own portfolios? Yeah, for me, I think <clears throat> I always believed that like story and IP would be the bridge between um, the mass adoption of 
crypto and NFTs. And it won't necessarily be the infrastructure or the technology, it's the IP. Like you talk about um, crypto punks or board apes, like look, Jay-Z got a crypto punk, right? Um, Steph Curry has a board ape, right? It was IP that was the, 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 the bridge between mass adoption. And so just looking at, you know, from an investment perspective, looking at the communities that are really engaging in, and have a, a, an identity, and I think is the most important thing, you know, an, a core identity, because that will always like withstand the test of time um, and withstand bear markets is like a, a, an identity and, and something that you can always um, is, is recognizable going to, you know, and I think that is really the what's really special about the community that is built being built around Aku, I didn't build it. Like they built it, the, the identity. And that's something that, you know, is really, you know, valuable to as we grow that and then the audience grows that there's still a, an identity that they can resonate with and a, and a, and a creed or ethos that um, represents that community. Um, yeah, and it's it's been amazing, like just watching both of you um, as your platforms and brands and your work is evolving and changing. Um, it's just been incredible to see, and I'm so excited to to continue to be able to watch and learn from you as as you grow um, as an investor, Marguerite in in Blockade, and then Micah is one of the collectors of an Aku piece and and someone on the um, you know on the journey the story. So we have a few questions. I think we can spend the next few minutes taking audience questions. We have a question from Mari. Um, what about the argument that digital art can be copied in perfect fidelity? I can own every CryptoPunk ever for free. So right-click save is a common meme that's used in the, the NFT space where people will say, you know, oh, I can just right-click save and now I own your NFT. Um, does one of you want to maybe explain why right-click saving on NFTs is not the same? Is owning an NFT? <laughs> so um, I guess like back when I was first learning about Bitcoin and how does this idea of internet money work and how come you can have like this, I, like it, it took me a while to understood, like to understand how distributed networks of like work, right? So with these tokens, there's unique identifiers associated with them so that the entire network validates that these items are the true items. And even though on the surface, it may look like however the information is being portrayed, it could be the music, it could be any sort of file um, experience, a virtual experience. It's not, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is the agreed upon asset that has ownership rights to it on the network. And those ownership rights can carry multiple different meanings. And I don't know if Micah, you wanna talk about that. Yeah, I, I think what it, what it goes back to, if I'm like a um, crypto punks is a community that that token represents your your position in that in that community. And as this thing grows, we're so early. As this grows, who's to say like Larva Labs doesn't say, okay, now all crypto punk holders get this right or that? Like that is like a, a something that we're still early. Like we're, we we got to think five, ten, fifteen, twenty years down the line. Only that crypto punk could get you something that like. You know, and, and just by being part of that community right now, it's identity, right? Right now it's identity, but there's utility that can be baked into that forever. And so that's what I really think the big difference is from like a, a, a when I think about IP or, or, you know, a PFP is like there's utility that's coming. Like there's it's it's yeah. it's very possible, a lot easier than just um, I don't know. That's the value, in my, in my opinion. Oh, we actually did that this week. So um, for Ether Rocks, you know, there's only 100 of them. We actually threw a party in physical space for Ether Rock owners exactly. and their friends. And your entry ticket was your NFT. So you could right click and save a picture. Um, but I think we're also starting to see that there are a bunch of NFT communities that do special artworks that are only available to access to, to people who own, you know, something from the original smart contract. And then Micah, as you were saying, the ability for you to know all of the collection in the world who own an Aku piece in their wallet and to be able to, you know, pop a movie ticket into to okay. those wallets or to drop them an NFT um, is super fun. No well, doubt, again, no doubt. To add to that, though, like, for example, the game application Neon District, you can have all kinds of pictures that look like Neon District game characters, but in game, you're only going to be able right. to combine and level up the assets which the game is reading from the blockchain data that this is the correct Neon District assets. So um, that utility is actually already, you know, apparent today. 
Yeah. And I think that's what's so amazing again is um, we have these new tools and people like both of you are building these new realities where we can use these tools in, in new ways. Um, that is all the time we had for today, unfortunately. There's so many more topics we could discuss. And hopefully for people who are watching, you can feel just the enthusiasm, the excitement, like the absolute electric energy that is, is happening right now in the creative space around NFTs. Um, in our next session, you are gonna hear not about NFTs necessarily, but you're gonna hear about creators in the music space who are changing business model for the music industry and monetizing their own platform, their own brand, in, in new ways and engaging with fans in new ways. So thank you, Marguerite. Thank you, Micah, so much for your time. I always learn so much from both of you um, and hopefully everyone in the audience has had a chance to do that today as well.